to this uh, afternoon session of this conference. Um, I'm asked to chair this session. I'm shipping Liu from USTC, China. And uh, uh, the first speaker this afternoon is uh, uh, Konrad Pesir uh, from, from Prague University, University of Berlin. Uh, his title is uh, Boundary Sensitive Horse Decompositions. Uh, let's welcome. Please, please uh, take it over, Konrad. Yeah, hello, everyone. From the early morning in uh, Germany. Uh, yes, you, you have set up a very nice conference, Applied Geometry for Data Sciences. And uh, the titles of the speakers are exciting. And uh, when I look back, maybe uh, really looking back 20 years ago, when all these discrete things started, these applied geometry uh, um, in this modern way started, it was when people talked about triangle soups and things like this, and there was no structure. And now it's really an amazing conference. And I think you are, if you are interested, do something out of it. It's, it's really something which is pushing, pushing this area uh, forward. Actually, I also have nice memories on Chongqing. About the same time, 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, I, I had some, some private trip along the Yangtze. And I came across Chong, Chong, Chong Qing at, at those days. And so it's a pity I'm not uh, around there in person today, but uh, let's talk science and uh, get in contact in other ways. The topic I'm talking about is uh, about Hodge decomposition. This has followed us for some time. And today I will talk about um, a work which is based on the thesis by Konstantin Pölke. So he is really the uh, innovator behind this. He made his thesis in uh, 2016, then there were follow-up papers 2017, and uh, also uh, up to Corona 2019, 2000, I think 2020 was the last one. And uh, the topic which has followed us is that uh, for several years, the Hodge decomposition has provided a very powerful tool in analyzing, yeah, in analyzing shapes, in analyzing uh, data structures on shapes, in uh, just providing more links between geometric analysis and topology, which are very, very helpful in, in our modern our applications and uh, basically an essential tool you can't get around with. So um, the topic here is the inclusion of boundaries in the classic Helmholtz Hodge decomposition. And uh, in a second, I will go a little bit more in detail what this uh, is about for those who are not so familiar with this. And then we see lots of applications coming out. Basically, the uh, pictures which I have put up on the title page, the left one includes a, a, a simple one form, a vector field on a geometric surface. And in order to emphasize the part uh, which is the topic of today is this surface is not only having some topology of a torus, but there's also linked some kind of boundary to it. And the essence of the uh, analysis today is uh, investigating the influence of the boundary. How does the boundary influence the properties of vector fields of one forms? Uh, given on some shapes, on 2D shapes, on 3D shapes. So what is the influence of the boundary, given that there is this classic Hodge Helmholtz decomposition available, separating vector fields and more general differential forms on, on, on manifolds. Um, then the classic decomposition leads into orthogonal subspaces of vector fields or one forms. And here with this boundary, that's the middle page, there is a certain non-orthogonality involved, which is basically not a, a deficiency of the, um, 
decomposition, which we are doing, but it's a so-called Poincaré angle, which has geometric information in itself. So the decomposition now with boundaries, if you're having higher genus, involves some angle and non-orthogonality. Yeah, but this at first hand looking like a, a, a non-efficient uh, decomposition turns out to have topology and geometric information involved. On the right side, there's some more information. You, you see this uh, hand and the hand has a um, certain boundaries included at the bottom of the hand and also at the three uh, left uh, fingers. There are some boundary curves included at the tips. And then the thumb makes with the first finger a, a non-trivial topology, a torus-like topology. So this example figure is a candidate to study uh, the decomposition. Um, I will show also other things coming out from medical applications, but let's stick with this and let's get into um, what this uh, decomposition is about, um, including this emphasis on the boundary. Yep. So the classic Helmholtz decomposition that just works for vector fields in the two-dimensional plane. You can take an open set in the plane or take, take R2 as a, a domain. So given any vector field, it might have, it might include noise, it might be arbitrarily weird, but any two-dimensional tangential vector field, then this has a unique decomposition into a divergence part and a curl part. And uniqueness depends on several side conditions there. But basically this decomposition is uh, in, in this sense, provides an exact representation of the vector field. And the issue is, even there might be noise in the original field, you still have this decomposition. And this decomposition goes that one part, the first part, is including all the divergence of the original field. The second one includes all the curl. And not only does the first part include all the divergence, it's also curl-free. That means it has some vector potential. It has a potential function, an integral of the vector field whose gradient makes up this first part. The second part, the curl part, certainly has not a vector potential directly, but if you turn the curl part by 90 degree, this is this operator J, then this becomes integrable. And so there's also related a vector potential, it's called a co-potential, whose gradient turned by 90 degree is giving the second part. So the first part is called the gradient part or divergence part. The second part is the co-gradient, co which is the gradient of a potential turned by 90 degree. So this way we have linked to this vector field two potential functions for the first part and the second part, which completely describe this vector field. Um, Hodge generalized this uh, analysis because if you're having a topology which is um, not simply connected, then there might be flows just along the fundamental group, along the uh, non-simply connected path along the manifold. And these lead to um, a third component, which is the so-called harmonic part. Harmonic part can be physically interpreted as some kind of uh, non-rotational, non-divergence having part, which is like you are flowing honey around the, the manifold. Honey, which has no rotation, which has no divergence. So it's basically like a thick flow. And uh, this is related to all the... Uh, non-trivial generators of the fundamental group. 
So it has topology information. This is the uh, general representation decomposition uh, of uh, Hodge Helmholtz on manifolds with non-trivial topology. Um, some years ago, we did some discretization of this um, for vector field analysis uh, in the uh, 2D case and uh, 2D case with uh, yeah, no boundary, basically assuming the surface is compact. What, what, what's about, why, why is there some interest in it? And I'm putting up here some statements that this decomposition is certainly interesting for just analyzing your vector field, analyzing the uh, flow directions, or maybe even the flow. And uh, this is, you might be interested, for example, in finding vortices on a stream on the ocean vortices, or you might want to find sinks and sources uh, in this way. I, I'm coining this as local feature detection because it's uh, related to singularities of the uh, individual singularities of the vector field. But also having the potential functions, the potential of the uh, gradient field respectively of the co-gradient field available. These two potential functions give you, if you are thinking about a, a pairs of them, give you the possibility to have assigned maps from let's say 2D to 2D on this. And this is something which has made a lot of use in uh, surface parameterization where analyzing these uh, maps allows from some given frame field on a shape, on a 2D shape, allows to give some parameterizations, making use of these uh, uh, maps. And uh, also, especially the harmonic part, which uh, uh, um, uh, links to the topology of the underlying uh, shape, this relates to uh, closing conditions for generating a global atlas on uh, 2D manifolds and also of 3D manifolds if you're going to 3D. Um, other applications go in the direction that um, you might follow up and more analyzing in more detail your, your shape itself. So you are interested in segmentation and you want to have feature lines and things like this. Also, in this way, you're, uh, uh, you might, encounter, might uh, um, approach this uh, by using vector fields going along features or orthogonal to features. And once again, you're, you're back in this uh, vector field analysis based, based on Hodge-Helmholtz. So given this, tremendous uh, impact on geometric application methods. It's interesting to uh, study in detail and especially look at the drawbacks. So the drawback of this is the classic Hodge-Helmholtz is made on closed manifolds, closed manifolds without boundary. So what people did whenever they had a boundary, they did some kind of uh, ad hoc construction. For example, saying the potential functions need to be zero at the boundary or have, have other issues over there. But basically the boundary was not part of a constructive, constructive uh, decomposition. And that's what, what this approach uh, is uh, now, now addressing. So we want to bring in the boundary as a constructive part. And here I'm showing two examples. On the left side, you are seeing a torus, which, which has some artificial boundaries. And the control of the field over there at these boundaries isn't, isn't part of the original game. Also on the right side, you see when working with uh, some CAD models in, in applied uh, geometry, the boundary and also the feature lines play an essential role. 
And you see, for example, where the arrow points in that these boundaries here in this part have not been sufficiently addressed. And that's a drawback. And that's what this new method just is addressing. Um, originally, Helmholtz started his uh, uh, research. It's uh, the integrals of hydrodynamic equations uh, which uh, relate to our uh, vortex uh, movements. That's from the middle of the 19th century. There was a lot of follow up after uh, this. Uh, you see the Ram, you see Hodge, you see Kodaira, Whitney. This goes along for several uh, years, even up to nowadays. And there was really some famous work in the continuous case, Cantarella, Gluck, the Turk which uh, came up and uh, focusing once again what the influence of boundary is in the continuous case. And basically what uh, Polka's work was is uh, looking at their work and finding a suitable discretization. It's not so easy to find discretizations um, given this because there needs to be very, very fine-tuned uh, selection of uh, function space and vector spaces in order to have all the geometric analysis and topology being included in this discretization. So this is um, what uh, I started with Preuss in uh, early 2000 for the original Hodge-Helmholtz on closed surfaces. And uh, then Polke uh, really finished up this and uh, did this on surfaces with boundary. This was 2016, he received best paper from SPM and also his PhD thesis was, was awarded. At the end, I'm providing links to all these papers so uh, you can look them up on the, on the web. But let me, let me remind uh, that uh, basically this discretization work is based on uh, smooth works by following by Friedrich's differential geom forms on Riemannian manifolds and follow up by Schwartz 1995 Hodge decomposition for solving boundary value problems. And then Cantarella and Al and Chonkwiller, which really put this in recent years on a Noel, st Noel uh, 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 stage including also these so-called Poincaré duality angles when uh, there's no orthogonal, orthogonal uh, decomposition available. It's on these works, which are Polka and we are basing our work and then coming up with these realizations. Um, let me check out the uh, framework. the framework on which, so I'm, actually there are some threads, some, some comments in, this, in the chat. I'm not really following the uh, thread, the chat at the moment. Okay, so here, these are basically, we are talking about the simplicial discretization, simplicial surfaces, simplicial volumes, and higher dimensional. Uh, this is the discretization of the manifold. Don't get me wrong, it's discretization of the manifold. The function spaces on top of this, they might not be following the simplicial uh, uh, setup, they might be uh, piecewise linear, but they might not be continuous. So these function spaces on this allow us the um, flexibility we need for this decomposition. Although keep in mind the manifold itself is a simplicial entity. And uh, the type of one forms or vector fields we are looking at because of this piecewise linearity, they are piecewise constant. So this means in terms of a vector field, you have a single vector per element. Then there is natural metrics assigned to this, which is also an, a two metric. 
which is given locally on each element. And so by summation, you're having a two metrics on the uh, manifold itself. And this is a consistent Hodge theory for simplicial surfaces and volumes, which is, which is uh, around. Um, the function spaces, they basically contain the essence. And that's a little, little bit different to other kinds of uh, discretization. So one type of function spaces is the most natural piecewise linear functions, so-called here space of conforming functions. This is linear on each triangle, given a constant gradient, and then continuous across the, uh, the whole simplicial surface. That's what we are calling L and L stands for Lagrange elements. That's the most basic uh, PL uh, space known in uh, finite element analysis, for example. And you know, there's lots going on, discrete minimal surfaces and things like this coming out of these uh, um, representations. I'm not going into this. The second space looks a little bit more weird. It's so-called creuset rabia elements which are so-called non-conforming functions. Uh, the first one were conforming, continuous. The non-conforming are also piecewise linear, but they are only continuous across tri edge midpoints on a triangle. You see some example on the right side where triangles are connected at the edge midpoints. That's where the continuity is, but not along the full edge. And this space is the complementary space which works uh, in, in, together with the Lagrange. So we are having the Lagrange finite elements and these creuset rabia finite elements. Actually, in numerics, they were came up a little bit late because of this NIST non-discontinuity they were uh, putting aside as being non-qualifying. But actually, you see both are uh, in the same way playing a game. And let me also remind uh, the, because we are talking about uh, the curl and divergence of vector fields as the first order differentials. And so the curl, you think about the curl at a point in the discrete way measures how much the vector field rotates around this point. And so it's given as the scalar product of the path around a point with the vector field. And looking at this in more detail, you see that a positive path integral gives a positive curl. Uh, rotating the other way around would give a negative curl. And uh, curl is zero basically when you are just flowing through this region without vortex in, in it. Um, in this discretization, um, this classic discretization located at vertices can be laid a little bit more fine tuned by rotating by looking at uh, just edges. And so having a, a more fine tuned discretization. And you see these two discretizations of a curl are exactly like in the smooth setup, the uh, conditions to decide whether a, a vector field, let's say a given in the Lagrange uh, setup is local integrable in the Lagrange setup if this curl at an edge is everywhere zero. So this is what you know from the, uh, different, the integrability condition of vector fields in the smooth setup. These are the conditions which also hold which are also essential in order to make this setup a, uh, yeah, a well done and uh, uh, discretization, which also has all these topology available. The uh, integrability in this non-conforming space relates to the other curl, to the curl at points. So here, these two curls, curls at a point and curl at, a, at an edge, uh, are really the essential ingredients in order to decide about local integrability. There's lots to say about, but I'm considering this as a reminder for those who are who are having a little bit in, 
And the interesting thing is that uh, these spaces are also with respect to some A2 metric, the space of curl free and divergence free are all piecewise orthogonal. And also the harmonic spaces are orthogonal. The harmonic space are those which are curl free and divergence free. And these are not zero, but if you're having topology, they relate to flows along the uh, fundamental groups, al about, along the non-trivial cycles on the surface or in a, in, in a volume. So finally, this is the original uh, decomposition which comes out of this game for closed shapes. And you see in this example on a torus, the left vector field is any vector field given there. It has a divergence part, which includes all the divergence. And uh, you see from the arrow, it goes from sources to sinks. The curl part is the part which covers the vortices, all the curl. And so it turns around some singularities. And the harmonic part is curl free, divergence free. And it relates to what I was saying about this thick honey flow, which just moves around a, a shape without having sinks and sources and without having any vortices. The interesting part, the harmonic part, the dimension of the harmonic part is very small. It relates to the dimension, to the uh, topology of the surface. It's uh, two times the genus. While the left two parts, they depend on the discretization. If you are having more triangles, you are having more, uh, the dimensions of these spaces go up depending on the discretization. The right part is independent of this. Um, yeah, there's some, some simple calculation behind this and it makes, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, supports the reason why to use these different spaces of Lagrange and uh, crozier ravia elements, because only by this choice, you're coming up that uh, you're having the right topology, uh, the right dimension in the space of harmonic uh, 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 flows. And uh, especially being discretization independent in the harmonic part. We will see this essential coming back once again in this decomposition with boundaries. Um, so the question now, if we are having a boundary, what do we want to call a harmonic field now? You see, at the boundary, you're only having half of the surface, half of the domains at the boundary, half of the neighborhoods being available. And the other half is just being chopped off. So let's start with defining a harmonic field on a surface with boundary to be just in the same way as before, it's divergence and curl free in the interior. At the moment we are saying we, 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 we are not having more information at the boundary. We are just uh, making a, a dump generalization of these uh, harmonic fields from the interior, from the interior from properties in the interior. If we are doing this way, and actually we are doing it this way, what happens is that the dimension of the harmonic fields now depends on the dim dimension we had before on the cohomology, that means on the topology, two times the genus. But now it's that the number of boundary edges comes into the game because there's so much flexibility at the edges along the boundary that uh, you can generate uh, yeah, lots of more harmonic fields in this sense. And it's not the boundary components, it's the boundary edges, the number of boundary edges. 
Uh, this makes this uh, notion of harmonic fields with on surfaces with boundary or volumes with boundary uh, discretization dependent. And discretization dependent is we are basically losing the topology information in the dimension of this space. So when we are doing this definition, we need to have a follow up definitions of fine tuning this space and finding those subspaces in these uh, harmonic fields, which only depend on the topology and not the discretization. So this is what's the issue here. This space so far is too large. It depends on the discretization. How does it come that it depends on the discretization? Because basically, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but you can have flows, harmonic flows, which move into the uh, surface along the boundary and shortly quit at some other point moving out and being everywhere harmonic. So this local in and out flow at the boundary is something which relates the, to the inclusion of the number of boundary edges in this dimension. And this is what we don't want because this is some local issues. Uh, the linkage to topology is lost. And uh, let's dig into harmonic fields and find, find better representation. One of these is in the space of harmonic fields, we are taking a subspace of fields which are orthogonal to the boundary. And this is what we are calling Dirichlet fields. Why Dirichlet fields? Because if these fields are orthogonal to the boundary, the potential function would be constant along the boundary. So you could assume now already that uh, from this constancy, there's a relation to topology because if you're having fields now whose potential is a constant along the boundary, you're just having the number of boundary curves to define constants as, their possible, as your possible choice. And then the last one is given by the choices you are doing on the uh, previous n minus one boundary curves. So finally, you are having from this already a nice relation to topology that this dimension of the Dirichlet fields is exactly the like we do, what we know from the classic Hodge, the two times the genus, but now the flexibility of the boundary components are minus one, where you can assign constants to constants to the potential functions. So here, this subspace does the job of being topology related to the topology of the interior, two times the genus, plus the topology, meaning the number of boundary curves. Um, alternatively, instead of being orthogonal to the boundary, you might also, you think you always have this kind of duality between divergence part and curl part. You might have uh, vector fields, which are just having basically a vortex at this boundary, an artificial vortex. So it just rotates around this boundary uh, component. That means it's orthogonal to this. It, it's uh, tangential to this boundary component. And this way, these Neumann fields being tangential to the boundary has the same properties that it's also having two times the genus, but plus number of boundary curves minus one as the dimension of the subspace of harmonic fields. And uh, these two together basically are our playing ground now in order to be more precise about some generalization of these uh, the Hodge decomposition. And basically there's also, as I mentioned already, because of this duality, there is a relation between these uh, two, two spaces. Um, so what we can do now is a first ad hoc decomposition 
And this basically is a generalization of the original hodge moray fridis decomposition, which says, okay, now let's decompose the harmonic spaces using the Dirichlet fields or using the Neumann fields either. This leads to two decompositions using the Neumann, using the Dirichlet, which has the nice fact that we are having a first part, which is uh, curl-free, which includes the divergence, a second part, which using the crucera var elements, which uh, includes all the curl and is divergence-free, and a third and fourth component, which are harmonic, but the fourth component includes the topology. And given the fact that we are using Neumann or Dirichlet, we are having these two, uh, two ways to decompose. That's very interesting and uh, basically comes out at ad hoc from what I was, was talking about. And you, you can see this also in uh, really uh, visually, geometrically, visually in our examples. So let's take a simple, and this is where this uh, sample comes in. We are taking a torus to have some topology on the compact part and then having a small inflow and outflow, the cylindrical part, which makes up our sample geometry. So we are having two boundary curves and genus one. And you see now that let's say the Dirichlet field makes up the dimension two times the genus. This is gives two plus the number of boundary curves is two minus one. This gives one. So in, in sum, we have three. This is the space of harmonic fields. And now you see basically the uh, uh, generators of this uh, space. On the right side, you are seeing the classic generators. That means flowing around the torus and uh, in one way and flowing the uh, orthogonal way around, around the loop. So, so these are the two generators. And you see, although these look to, seem to look to uh, exist only on these torus, the vector fields have an exponential decay also on the cylindrical part. So they are non-zero along this cylindrical part. But the uh, third generator, which relates to the boundary, this is what you would expect. It should be orthogonal to the boundary. And so the, the generator is flowing in the boundary, flowing out. So now we, these three generators make up the space of all vector fields on this uh, sample geometry. Um, so this is how this first decomposition would make up some real intuitive uh, uh, notion of our decomposition of flows. Actually, the uh, Neumann fields have a very, very similar decomposition. Um, in the only difference basically is on the uh, uh, part with boundary where these Neumann fields are tangential flowing around the boundary. And if they are flowing around one direction along the first boundary, then this induces that they are flowing around the same way on the second one. That's what you can imagine how this boundary curve minus one comes into the, the game. Good. Um, there's also a lot of fine tuning you can uh, do further, uh, especially because the inner topology and the fields on the inner part, the compact part, how do they relate to the uh, fields on the boundary part? Because of time, I can't get into this, but this is very interesting uh, how this cohomology is split and how the exact and co-exact fields are uh, basically relating to each, each other. That's basically separating the cohomology of the boundary and uh, or relating the cohomology of the boundary with the cohomology of the interior. And what we found out these uh, discrete function spaces goes is well in line with the smooth results by Schonkwiller Gluck, the Turk, and Cantorella from these uh, recent years. Um, there is a question now 
we are having two decompositions using Neumann and using Dirichlet fields. And this yeah, gives you a little bit to think about. In practice, it wouldn't, it would spoil a little bit your game because you need to decide on working with Neumann fields or Dirichlet fields. So can we do better? Can we do have a decomposition? Because you see the Neumann and the Dirichlet fields along the boundary, they are locally orthogonal. The Neumann fields are tangential to the boundary, the Dirichlet fields are orthogonal. And so they, they seem to be good candidates to include in a more intelligent decomposition to be both included. And uh, the question whether the orthogonality can be pushed through, that's something we need to comment a little bit later because it can't be put through in some cases especially if the topology of the compact part is non-trivial, then there is these so-called uh, angles between these spaces. But as I said, this is not a drawback, but that's including further geometric information about the underlying shapes. So let's move them together. Here are some, uh, Actually, these angles are measured in an L2 sense. They are not measured for individual uh, uh, vectors, but in an L2 sense integrated over the manifold. And you see here an example that in this uh, decomposition where we are including now both the Neumann and the Dirichlet fields, you see here on this image with the zoom on the right side, they are not fully orthogonal. And so in an L2 sense, there is some L2 integral of these non-orthogonality, so-called Poincaré angle, which is actually uh, of, of interest. But still, they are so much different that uh, they are, are spanning, are helping to span the full space. Um, let's skip these uh, examples here now. Um, there is some measurement around, depending on the boundary, and you are, can analyze uh, these vectors, uh, these, these angles, L2 angles, so-called Poincaré angles, uh, which, which really makes sense. And we will see a little bit later what kind of uh, information is, is in there. So one of our... Um, the, the measurement here in these numbers is that one over five, seven is pi over pi over two. And so in some cases there is some orthogonality and some other one there are, they are different from this. Um, so the decomposition for an underlying surface with genus zero is that this harmonic part on the right side. So we are always having the uh, divergence part and the curl part as the left components. But in the previous one, we had the harmonic plus the Dirichlet or the harmonic plus the uh, Neumann. So now this harmonic is split into three parts. The three parts are including the uh, Neumann and Dirichlet, both, and then some remaining part, which is here put in the center. So the in the center is harmonic fields, which are not Neumann and not Dirichlet, which are in fact orthogonal to these uh, spaces and which are depending on the discretization. And so in this, this main theorem, we are having that we are having a discretization where the harmonic parts on the right side, the fourth and fifth component, have topological information, and that I mentioned is two times the genus plus number, number of boundary components minus one, as we are having before, but now they are included. The issue why we are having two statements here 
is depending on the genus. If the genus is a sphere, we are having genus zero, then harmonic and the Neumann and Dirichlet components are orthogonal to each other, as well as to the other ones, L2 orthogonal. If the genus is bigger than zero, then they are still having a direct sum to build up this decomposition, but it are no longer uh, orthogonal. There is this point ray angle involved, which has information. It's not a drawback. <laughs> yeah, don't misunderstand me there. Good. So let's take an example here. Let's take this hand from the uh, um, first page from the cover page. And this has three, uh, it has four boundary components on the bottom of the hand and also on the three fingertips. And you are seeing now the uh, space of harmonic fields, the basis fields being displayed. So on the left side, we are having basically three um, directly fields which enter the game on one of the tips and then flow out elsewhere. We are having these basically for each finger or by linear combination by two fingers and whatever, but these are related to these uh, fingers and the holes at the fingertips. And then we are having two components which relate to the compact part. And the compact part is the torus made up by the thumb and the first finger they are closed. So here we are having two classic, in the classic sense, harmonic generators flowing around this hole or flowing around these uh, loop of, of uh, thumb and, and, and finger. So that's, uh, that's very classic. But you're seeing here, it's really exciting that these things come out as generators. And if you're a little bit <laughs> out of applied geometry, then you know that this is really a key, key tool which you can uh, uh, employ in, 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 uh, in, in applications, make, uh, make use out of it. It relates the geometry and the topology of this uh, system of uh, compact genus with boundary. And this duality angle um, is uh, something which, which leads to, as I said, it has some impact on geometry. And basically it leads to shape signatures. The duality angle between the spaces, um, you see each of these spaces has some dimension. And so we are getting a set of uh, duality angles in there. This is independent of the choice of vector fields and depends just on the boundary and not only on the uh, topology of the boundary on the bound number of components, but on the geometry. That means the length of the boundary and how this length relates to the space. So for example, here is uh, some, topo some Poincaré angles being displayed, taking a sequence of uh, increasing, cu increasingly cutting out or boundaries, cutting out pieces of these torus. On the left side, there is um, just a tiny two, two tiny boundaries being, uh, two tiny pieces being cut out. And then we see that these point gray duality angles are close to zero, the first part, and the other one is close to pi over two. So that means the first ones, they are just going in parallel, and the second one is they are, they are fully orthogonal. The more we are cutting out, these zero angles increase, and the uh, pi over 2 angle, that's for some, some other properties that stays as pi, pi over 2. But the zero angles do increase. The more we are cutting out, they increase and increase, and this means it's a shape signature. The point gray duality angle measures how much boundary is being around on your shape compared to the overall shape you're, you're having. 
And that's very interesting because you measure this in the space of vector fields of one forms. And uh, that's a completely different uh, entity where you are now measuring the impact of boundaries on a shape rather than just measuring something, let's say, like the length of the boundaries. And uh, these things together are very exciting. So we pushed this uh, uh, forward and uh, we're looking in several applications out of this. Um, what we are having as a summary, we have a discretization uh, of Hodge-Helmholtz type on uh, surfaces and volumes with boundary. So this original work, which is where our, our applications here are based on is by Pölke. And I'm putting this up for the readings. This is the web link to our, his PhD thesis, Hodge type decompositions for piecewise constant vector fields. Uh, actually, there's a typo on surfaces and solids. That means on 2D surfaces and 3D volumes with boundary. Then uh, one piece you might want to look up is this uh, publication at, the, at SPM. Got the best paper over there. There is another publication which is based in a Springer book, nine, 2019. It's uh, more focused on Poincare duality angles as shape signatures. So I was just presenting the numbers here. If you're interested in these shape signatures, that's the uh, uh, location to go for. Um, Raza Finder Azaka, uh, we together with the medical uh, center in Berlin, the Charity, that uh, Guberitz and his uh, group uh, were focusing on uh, flows in our uh, arteria uh, to analyze vortices because uh, vortices and other singularities, because if you're having these kind of singularities in your blood flow, this has severe impact on uh, the uh, behavior of your, your arteria and uh, leads to uh, yeah, medical issues over there. So you like to control this and based on uh, 3D scans of these kind of things, they were using these Hodge type uh, decompositions to analyze these uh, properties. So let's summarize, we have a complete decomposition in divergence part using Lagrange elements, curl part using crozet rabia elements, a center part of harmonic fields, which are discretization dependent, and then the fourth and fifth component, which are the Neumann and the Dirichli harmonic fields. Um, we have also seen their additional to the relation to topology of the dimension of Neumann and Dirichlet fields. The Poincaré angle is uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, property which relates differential geometry, the Riemannian metric into the, this game. It is really some, some novel geometric measure to uh, study the impact of boundary to the overall shape and the differential forms. Okay, thank you so much for listening. I hope you find this interesting. I think these shares will be these slides will be shared so you can follow up these uh, links over there. And I'm open for a question if there is some some time for this. Thank you very much for my side. Okay. Uh, many thanks for this very inspiring talk. Are there any quick questions and comments? Yeah, maybe I ask one. Uh, so you, you are, you are uh, discussing this uh, harmonic fields uh, of uh, surfaces with boundaries. So what happens if you consider uh, non-compact surfaces and with an infinite uh, uh, discretization. And what can we say about the dimension of the harmonic fields uh, in that case? Non-compact, you mean having boundary available? Uh, uh, without boundary. So it's uh, 
uh, it's like you 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 think about uh, infinite uh, triangulation. Ah, you you mean you mean just in the air? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, certainly, then also these spaces will become uh, having infinite dimension. So this uh, pushes forward, and uh, I'm. I'm not sure because the the integrals might also are, uh, extend to infinity. So you would need to have, in contrast to the original statement of compactness, you would need to have some com kind of compactness on your function spaces that these L2 integrals are still valid and making sense. And then you can find up some, some similar statements. Um, I'm not fully exploring this, but this is uh, certainly the first thing you 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 might need to do in order to uh, generalize these results. Yeah, very okay. good question. Okay, thank thanks. you. Uh, so Kaling has a question. Yeah, uh, be quick. So uh, your model is based on this like 2D surfaces, and uh, there are other discretization of host Laplacians are based on like graph or spatial complexes. Can you comment on the you know this discretization of different like uh, representations? So uh, this this discretization is is valid for surfaces and for volumes. So this is what the original uh, work from Perke is already uh, about, mm -hmm. and. Um, you see, when we are going into the discrete world, we need to come up with discrete notion of our domain. And uh, you might use uh, simplicial surfaces as I was using here, because simplicial surfaces are most natural things where in, in, in large parts of applied geometry. Yes. Uh, but on top of this, then uh, in this setup, we are having discretizations of the function spaces. And you're having flexibility in this. Uh, so you have flexibility in using certainly different discretizations of your domain. And they are different in algebraic, discrete algebraic topology. Uh, there are different notions or different discretizations around. There's a multitude of discretizations around. And because we are talking here about uh, linear spaces, there are certainly projections of these uh, decompositions onto other uh, discrete domains, leading to other representations. Mm -hmm. It's in, in the, let's say, in the most natural way, it's really some kind of different uh, linear algebra discretizations by projection. You are changing the, the underlying basis. Mm -hmm. And this has impact both on the discretization you are choosing on the domain and the discretizations you are choosing in function space. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's basically more a, a, a taste you are um, choosing when going in applications where you are putting the focus in here. Mm -hmm. uh, here with these having simplicial underlying domains is a choice we did because that's always in our application the mm -hmm. most natural way where we get our data where our customers want to have information on it. But certainly you can go into any other underlying graph representation as well. Um, I mean, I'm I, I'm a little bit putting myself now out of the window by saying to any because you you might have some some additional constraints, but I'd I like to like to uh, communicate the idea which is underlying that this is a linear algebra or, or activity then to to go to different representations, and it might work or it might not work. Certainly, if it works, it's an accomplishment that it's also in, in some other activities. And uh, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, 20 years ago, people talked about triangle soups. <laughs> they were not looking at uh, more detail, not believing that there is more information around. And now we are seeing this universe of uh, additional structure in there. And there's lots of things to explore these, these and what we've done was basically, yeah, uh, 
bringing a, a footstep out into the uh, discrete world of the smooth results. And uh, I'm looking forward to what comes out over the, the next many years in these, in these aspects. Thanks for this yeah. question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very nice coffee. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 